The Idaho 4 case just continues to raise many, many, many questions. And a man who has uh, shared many of those questions with us is joining us today here on About the Law. Lucky, welcome. Hey, Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Uh, unfortunately, Lainey had a scheduling conflict, so she can't be with us. But uh, welcome to the show. It's good to have you with us. It's good to be here. All right, Lucky. So uh, we often, I don't know if you've followed us or not, we often have done uh, episodes in which we say, here are 10 questions, or here are five questions, or here are four red flags. That's been our approach to the Idaho 4 case. I noticed that you have gone into a lot of detail on some of these issues. You really have delved into them. So I wanted to invite you here today to talk to us about, and we'll get into the details, but I'm just wondering if you were going to do an episode about the five top episodes episodes and we can get into them. What are your top five questions about the Idaho four case? Wow. My top five, I, there, there's so many, Yeah, uh, but I would have to say that, uh, I mean, we would have to talk about my, the number one, I think would be the eight hour time delay in calling nine one one. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 you know what, I've uh, spent a lot of time and like I said, we've done all these episodes. So last night I said, what would my top five be? So I put everything down. Right. And I sat down, I walked the dog to clear my mind and I came back and I wrote down a bunch of issues. I got up to seven, uh, but we're only going to do the top five. My number one is the eight hour delay. Right. That's my number one. So we right. have not prepared. We have not talked about this. We just agreed no. to, we just agreed to meet today on StreamYard and, um, but the eight-hour delay raises a lot of different questions, and I know you did an episode on that. What are the what are your top issues within that eight-hour delay? I think the biggest issue with the eight-hour delay is is there's really no explanation for it. You know, it's really I mean, there's really no explanation for not calling nine one one for eight hours. And at first, I had thought, well, maybe these two roommates maybe weren't home and came home to this and that's why the the 911 call took so long but then to hear that you know that that one of the roommates actually witnessed the intruder you know just after 4 a.m and still didn't call 911 uh that that raises a lot of questions yeah it certainly does and then uh they uh said that bethany funk was there then if you read the affidavit of uh richard batante it doesn't right. clearly come right straight out and say that she was there. It said that there were six people in the unit, uh, and it said that uh, she was there the next morning. But it doesn't clearly say that she was there, right. uh, and she's avoided the whole thing. She's tried to – she hired a lawyer to uh, not have to testify at the preliminary hearing, and then they did away with that with the indictment. So – I agree with you. There's just so many questions about those two girls and it just, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. And I, I, I think that, you know, if you watched the very first <clears throat> press conference that chief Fry did, you know, everybody was just kind of listening to what he was saying. And as soon as he said there was two, you know, there was also two other roommates in this house, the whole room went silent because that's when everybody, I think that's when the confusion really hit because I think people were confused about how two people could be in this house and nobody called 911 for so long. And um, there's no psychological diagnosis mm -hmm. as frozen shock phase. Now, <clears throat> people can attack me and say, well, you know, that's not what he means. But what is a frozen shock phase? As I think you've pointed out, you know, five and six year olds have seen crimes and they have reported them. So, right. My first analysis, and I might be wrong, and people will tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, but neither do they. Um, my right. first analysis was, you know, they're kids. They were on substances, and they needed to sleep those substances off. But I don't know if that – I don't know if – I don't know if that explains the whole seven- or eight-hour delay. I just don't think it can. Can it? I don't think so. I, I mean – if she was in frozen shock, then obviously she knew that something tragic had happened. So I just don't I, I just don't see her going back to bed. I, I just I, I just don't I don't see I, I don't understand how 
she saw this intruder and if she was in frozen shock then she obviously knew that something tragic had happened inside the house and still never she never called 911 no it was a uh, others others called and, and, right and the the really odd thing uh, and i agree with what you just said um i mean you can either have a frozen shock phase or you can be sleeping and not wake up until 11:58 when uh, the police were called you can't have it both ways it you can't have both it doesn't work if you see something that's shocking to you like you just said how do you go back to sleep so right. that, uh, then we fast forward to 11:58, when the police were in fact called and when the police got there lo and behold there's people standing outside i don't i don't think to this day we know exactly how many people there were do we we don't and i think that you know that was another thing at the press conference you know chief fry stated that there were people in the house when the 911 call was made right and i think that's a big reason about why they're not releasing the 911 call because i think there's people in the background possibly talking about details in the background you know they stated that that the person you know the operator talked to a number of different people on this 911 call so it wasn't just one caller so i think that's why they're not releasing that that call is cuz i think there's a lot of information in that 911 call and that's unusual because I think, as you know, before I was an attorney, and I've been an attorney for an awful long time, I was a reporter. Right. And when uh, I was a reporter uh, and there was some big crime, you wouldn't know anything about it until you went to the arraignment. And then when you get to the arraignment, the prosecutor would, I mean, and I, I go back to the old fashioned paper days, they would have so many copies of the police report and they'd give it to you. And they would also allow you to hear the 911 call. And you would learn that right away at the arraignment. Uh, and so, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I've heard people refer to the police reports, correct me if I'm wrong, the police report has never been made public? Yeah, yeah. In addition yeah. to the 911 call. So, In addition to the 911 call. So the, the other issues, I mean, there's so many issues that you pointed out in your really great um, episode that you did previously. Uh, and one of them is, how come, how come there's only one latent footprint? I don't understand that. Why is there only one? Right. Right. And, and, <laughs> and, and it's strange, but I, th I feel like maybe somebody was walking around this house through the crime scene after this all happened. And that's where that footprint came from. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe, I don't feel like that was that that footprint belonged to Brian Koberger. I just don't see Brian Koberger wearing vans. I just, I just don't see him in, in vans. Let's move on to number two, because my my other issues kind of um, dovetail with number one. But uh, what what are your other issues? What's number two on your list? Uh, I guess number two for me would be the way that law enforcement kind of cleared everything right away. So you know they they nine one one was called eleven fifty eight, and then. They, they put out an alert, the University of Idaho put out an alert at just after one in the afternoon. And then they issued a shelter in place at just after 3 p.m. Right. And then 30 minutes later, they lifted that shelter in place. And, you know, they cleared a bunch of people really fast. And it just seemed like law enforcement knew something as soon as they got there. It, 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 well, I, I, if that's true, that is just mind numbing. It's just mind numbing. If that, if that is true, um, I was going to comment on what you said about they cleared people so fast, the two jacks and some of right. these people that they cleared right away, they did it on a phone call. That's not police work, right? That's not how police work. That's right. not, the, that's not the way an investigation is done. Right. I right. Mean, that's why, that's what makes me believe that they came upon something as soon as they got to the crime scene, because I mean, if you if you really think about it, you know, they they lifted the shelter in place right away at the University of Idaho. Uh, they cleared a bunch of people right away. Right. And then, you know, Chief Fry came out and told everybody that, you know, the community was not in any danger. They didn't believe there was any danger to this community. So I that's, want, you know, well, here's what I read into that. I'll let you say whatever you want about uh, what you read into that. 
What I read into that is uh, knowing a little bit, which I know is dangerous, knowing a little <laughs> bit about um, government and public policy courses at the graduate level. Right. Uh, one of the first things all people in government are trained to do, I don't care whether it's police, town managers, fire spokesmen, other emergency spokesmen. I'm not talking about the people that do the work on the ground. I'm talking right. about the people that are in management and public policy. They are trained to assuage the public, tell them that they're in control and there's no reason to. So I'm wondering if it's anything specific to this case or they were just saying, oh, everything's OK. And as an example, and there's a million examples because you see it on the news every night. Oh, there's no danger. When right. Three Mile Island and I'm from Pennsylvania, when Three Mile Island had their core melt, they said no radiation has been released from Three Mile Island. That was before the NRC's dosimeter team got there. So, right. I mean, public officials are known to just tell us things. That's my theory about why they said there's no danger. I don't know. What's yours? I, I could see that. I mean, to me, it does seem kind of dangerous, though, to tell people that they're safe, you know, because to me, anybody who can commit this type of crime is obviously a dangerous person to have in the community. So I, I just thought it was strange that they assured the public that there was no danger to the community, but they didn't have a suspect at the time. Right. So I think even the public and even the people in that community, I think thought that was kind of strange because I remember watching some of the interviews with some of the students that were on the U of I campus and they were saying, you know, how, how can they tell us we're safe if they don't have a suspect? Well, doesn't this go to some of the things that the university president, Scott Green, has said? I mean, he wrote a whole book about uh, yeah. management and how he <laughs> right. saved the university. The university was in the jaws of bankruptcy and he, he saved the university. Then the very last chapter, which we did an episode on, uh, was about this case. But, you know, He's an administrator and he wants everything to look like it's a it's a good thing. We want to make sure that the parents know that this is a safe community. So I'm right. just thinking if this is kind of like what I said before, they just want to tell everyone who sent their kids off to the University of Idaho. It's OK. I agree. So, I agree. So. Some reassurance. That's all. So what's yeah. uh, what's number uh, what's number three on your list? I guess number three for me would be the idea that one individual committed these crimes, that yeah. one individual, you know, took the lives of four victims with just a, a sharp edged blade. Yeah. That to me raises red flags because that was when I very first heard about these crimes, that was a, that was what drew me to these crimes was the idea that four people had lost their lives in this house and it was, and, and only one person did this with a sharp edged blade. Cause I'm yeah. thinking, how did he get to all four people? Yeah, no, you I'm know? with you. I'm with you hundred percent. One of the first things I said was there's no way there's right. just absolutely no way that one person did this against four people. And it's out there that uh, Kaylee had 54 stab wounds right. um, and just the level of atrocity. But let me play devil's advocate with you. And we haven't, we haven't talked before about this. Right. Whenever I say what you just said, and I agree hundred percent, whenever I say, Oh, there's no way that one person could have done this. People point out to me, me that, well, BTK's first killings was a family of four, a father and a mother and two kids. I believe they were 11 and nine. And then there was Ted Bundy, who went into the sorority in Florida and committed multiple acts of, of destruction. So that's right. what people say to me. Well, so if Ted Bundy and BTK could do it, why couldn't Brian Koberger do it? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think Brian Koberger maybe could do it. I mean, I, we don't know. We don't know. No. You know, maybe, no. he, maybe this guy was training privately to, to, to do something like this, but I just, I don't feel that I, I, I think it would be difficult given the time, given the timeline. Yeah. Now, if this guy had more time, then I would say that would increase the possibilities, but in that, in such a short timeline, you know, I think this this crime would be hard to 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 commit if if you didn't know the layout of the house right. and and you don't know the victims at all. So you don't know, you know. I think to pull it off in that short of amount of time, 
I, I think would be very difficult. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible because I think anything's you know possible, but it would seem yeah. like the stars would literally have to align for him to commit this crime by himself. Especially if he'd never been in that house before. If he'd never been in that house, you know, how could he be in there? Now, there, there, there are there are um, statements out there that he would drive up on that road that was behind the house and look inside and, you know, right. watch Maddie uh, doing whatever she was doing inside of there. But just from looking at the house from the back, you know, you don't get the idea of the layout of the house. And even if he found a floor plan, you really need the feel of a house. How far away is that door? How how hard is it to get up to the stairs and take a left? So I'm with you on that all the way. And I'm going to jump ahead to number five on my list all right. was the timeline. The timeline <laughs> makes absolutely no sense. I mean, no. and I don't even know if we have a timeline. The 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 probable cause affidavit says that the murders happened between four and four twenty five. But then it says what at four oh six, the car was making a three point turn. And right. then at what I forget, is it four sixteen that it was seen speeding away? So right. is it four o'clock or is it four oh six or is it a lot of stuff? You know, a lot yeah. of stuff happening at 4 a.m. You know, you have this DoorDash yeah. order and you've got Xana's on TikTok. And, it, you know, it, it's a very strange timeline because it almost seems like they're just it almost seems like there was a lot going on in this house. And a quadruple homicide just happened to happen at that same time. It's very it, strange. And I, we've pointed out on a previous episode where we did look more uh, thoroughly into those times and the 417 dog barking and all the rest. Right. Um, that time, it just can't, uh, all of these things could not have happened in that timeline. I'll just say that from what I've seen and read and heard. I agree. It just couldn't. But now if Brett Payne, who authored the exhibit A to the, uh, to the probable cause affidavit, if he goes on the stand and he changes that, now there goes his credibility. So, right. I mean, A, the timeline's got to change. But B, if the timeline changes, now the credibility goes out the window. It's just it makes no it makes no sense to me. To, I mean, to me, it almost feels like they zeroed in on Brian Koberger and then began building everything around him. You know, rather than yeah. placing him inside the crime, it seems like they're building the crime around him. So it just yeah. seems kind of strange how they're putting it all together with because originally, you know, they they believed that these crimes happened between two and three. Right. Right. So, yeah. What's the next issue on your list, Lucky? I'm going to have to say the U-Haul truck, man. <laughs> that U-Haul truck that, I, you know, to watch a, a chief of police pull up in a U-Haul truck and start removing what I feel is potential evidence out of the crime scene. I mean, it's still an active crime scene. It just seems strange to me that they were moving this stuff out in a U-Haul. And he drove you know? it there. The chief and of police drove, drove the U-Haul there. It's just, yeah. no, don't they have like an evidence van? Uh, every police department I've ever been familiar with had some kind of an evidence van or something yeah. that um, they used to transport stuff. Although, was it even evidence? My understanding was they returned a lot of it to the parents. Didn't Mr. Ge Steve Gonzalez talk about how they got the trash can back and it was still full mm -hmm. of trash? Right, right. You know, but but I wonder when they got that stuff back. I don't because know. Just, I, I don't know that it's been confirmed when they actually re did receive their stuff. And I've always thought that maybe they had gone in to get Dylan and Bethany's things as well. Because they would have yeah. needed their stuff as well. Their stuff would have still been in that house. Right, right. So right. I wondered they, if, you know, they were moving some of that stuff out as well. Well, I guess they would have had to because we're if they had been following correct protocol, which obviously they weren't. Uh, I don't think Dylan and Bethany would have been allowed back into that house once the police uh, arrived, would they? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. No. You know, no. I wouldn't think so. I would think that at that point they would have, you know, they would have closed off the crime scene. OK, you kind of alluded to what was number two on my list. Number two on my list, number one being the eight hour delay. Number two was just the excessive secrecy that has surrounded this case from the very beginning, um, right. my my read on it is that it's it's not that it's not a big case to begin with, but the fact that the um, the fact of the crime being on national TV, all the networks for six weeks, it happened on uh, November 13th of 2022. And until they arrested Mr. Koberger six weeks later, it was on all the network news shows 
every right. night and they would show the pictures of the four young people and say, there's still no, still no suspect in the Idaho four. And right. then a suspect, uh, Mr. Koberger was arrested and charged with it. And immediately they clamped down with these mm -hmm. non-dissemination orders. So they created, they created their own curiosity in all of America everywhere. And then they, they shut it off. Right. And my, my contention is that not only is that what created all the focus on it, but it makes the whole case. Maybe everything's on the up and up. I right. don't know, but I right. don't know. It just seems a little bit odd that there's so much secrecy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, they, there's so much secrecy, but then they always seem to come out with a statement or they always come out and say something that doesn't make sense. So basically it kind of fuels that fire you know, to where everybody, you know, where there's a lot of speculation because right. they're trying to keep everything secret. But then, you know, you have people close to the case that are, you know, talking about leaking some information and stuff like that. And so I think that creates to, you know, that, that it, you know, creates confusion because everything is so secret, but then we have these little bits of information that keep coming out and they don't make sense either. So no. I've never you know. seen a case. I've never seen a case like it. And people say, "Oh, there's so much that's been released." No, there's not. If you and I know that you look at the docket all the time from listening to you. If you look at the docket, I'd say three quarters of it is a uh, motion to seal, seal granted, right. motion to redact, redact. And if you took all the things on the docket that were sealed and redacted and just downright not disclosed, there would be very little left. So. Right. It's it, it it's very troubling, uh, especially when they have these hearings, which they do. And then little bits and drabs come out. Uh, for example, the right. most recent hearing, I'm sure you noticed it, too. Uh, Ann Taylor and you've gone into depth about her. Uh, Ann Taylor has revealed that, oh, they did finally get the cast report, but it's only in a draft form. Uh, right. And she's she just now has received the. Um, autopsy x-rays just now that's 15 months after the autopsies were done i've dealt with cases like this and um autopsy uh, radiographs or x-rays are are immediate and uh, how hard would it have been for the state to copy them and just send them over why did it take 15 months right it, it, right well and that's what i i have a hard time understanding when i'm watching this hearing is, you know, like I've said before, people say, well, but they've, they've dropped 51 terabytes of information. And, you know, I've said before, I would rather just have one terabyte of actual evidence. You know, why, why she's going to have to sift through all that. And that's going to take time. And that's going to prolong, you know, this trials, because she's going to have to sift through all this stuff. Do you know what's really questionable is this video she's now mentioned in the two hearings in January and February. There's this video that she only has pieces in. What's that all about? <clears throat> if it's an accurate video that can be authenticated and offered into evidence at trial, it's got to be a video. It starts right. and it finishes. None, none of this. Oh, <laughs> lucky. I'm going to give you about, you know, two seconds of it here. And next week I'll give you a minute. And then, you know, Easter day, I'll give you another couple of uh, right. seconds of it. And then, you know, is somebody editing all that? What is it that somebody is like, they don't know how to edit video and they're just like putting it together piece by piece. That makes zero sense to me. None. I, I don't think they have, I, I don't think they have a solid video. I, I think that they did piece it together from traffic cams and, you know, whatever other types of video they could find around that area. Cause you know, they're following him from Pullman, Washington, all the way to Moscow, Idaho, and right. then back again. So I think they're 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 piecing it together. Oh, okay, but Is I don't that... believe I don't believe that I don't think that's the video she's talking about though. Because actually, in the hearing, she said, and this kind of caught my attention, because she said, "I'm not talking about the video of Brian's car." Right. And I was right. thinking to myself, maybe you shouldn't. You know. Maybe that so what is she Ryan's talking car. about? <laughs> what is she talking about? What is what is this video? Because because if it's what know. you said before, that it's all these different videos, you know, maybe this one's from 7-Eleven. Maybe this one's right. from your house. Maybe this one's from my. 
that's all separate videos and they would have to go in separately. My understanding of evidence law, and I know I'm not, I'm licensed in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. I'm okay. not licensed in Idaho. I don't know. But if you want to introduce something into evidence, you have to authenticate it and lay a foundation. And what that means is you've got to say, this is the video from the 7-Eleven store. And now we're going to have the 7-Eleven manager come in and authenticate it and say, yes, that came from my camera on that date at that time. And this is a fair and accurate representation of that. You can't just have a mishmash of putting them all together. So it can't be that. I don't think unless they... I I don't know. You know, I I think there's a lot of video. I I think, I feel like there's a lot of video. You know, Steve Gonsalves, he said that this trial, you know, is going to involve a lot of technology. He said it's going to be like a trial that people have never seen because of the amount of technology that's going to be used. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's a lot of video or I mean, with all that video, you would have thought that they would have had a license plate number. Or something like that, you know, I something that would identify that would match Brian Koberger to this car. Well, did you watch the uh, Murdoch trial? The I Alexander didn't. Murdoch trial that had a ton of technology. I mean, talk about the cast data. Talk about uh, data from the car itself. The guy came in from Detroit and and delivered the uh, floppy disk with uh, the um, information from that. Of course, they had the the TikTok, which was the smoking gun. So that was a trial that had a ton of technology, all of which yeah. really fried Mr. Murdoch's butt. And if he if he gets another trial, which I doubt, I don't think it's going to have a different result. But um, right. Okay, what's next on your list i think we've done three what's next on your list of the issues i i guess i would have to say knocking down the house you know demolishing the crime scene yeah well i'm gonna play devil's advocate by the way i agree with you 100 percent. but i'm gonna play devil's advocate and say well you know we did a lidar and a radar and a infrared and we've we've uh, we went in there and we measured every square inch of the place and so the jury will see all of that so i'm playing devil's advocate so right. so what they took it down yeah i i mean i feel like it's great that they have all these models and it's great that they have you know that they're able they have all this technology to do all this stuff but it, I think it would not take the place of the actual crime scene. And I do feel that, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's not common for people, for jurors to walk through a crime scene. But this isn't just any crime. This is a quadruple homicide. This is, I mean, the whole world is watching this. Right. So I feel like this might be one of those cases where the jurors would like to walk through that crime scene you know, maybe to get an idea of sound, what you could hear from upstairs to the main floor and what, you know, just kind of getting those those feels of of the real crime scene, I think would have had a big impact on the jury. I agree 100 percent. And the other thing, having tried jury trials, you know, you prepare, you look at your files, you anticipate what a witness is going to say, you anticipate what the other side is going to say, you right. antis- you try to anticipate everything, but no trial and uh, a trial attorney would be lying if he told you, oh, everything goes according to my plan. In my two jurisdictions, jurors are allowed to ask questions. They submit it on a form to the judge and then the judge calls us up to the bench and says, what do you think about this question? And you always say, yeah, because if you tell a juror they can't ask that question, you're in deep you know what. So right. I've never tried a case where something unanticipated didn't come up. So what if a juror has a question about, uh, well, what about this angle? What about that angle? Could you really, as you said, could you hear things from one floor to the next? What if a juror asks a question that can't be answered by these LIDARs and radars and all the rest? You know, I don't think a juror is going to like that, that they destroyed the evidence and they can't, uh, you know, have an answer about that. It's just, I agree with you 100%. uh, Well, I think- Go ahead. I think what's going to end up, I think what could be on a lot of these jurors' minds is how did these roommates not hear what was happening in the house? Exactly. And I, and I think that that's very important, you know? So I think it would be really important to have the crime scene so that it could be demonstrated, you know, whether, whether, whether the people on the main floor could hear from the upper level or not. Did you see how flimsy that house was? It seemed like oh. one bang with a backhoe, the whole thing crumbled. It was student yeah. housing. You know, th- this is this was an old structure. It was it was an yeah. ad- there was an addition to it. 
you know, it, it was it was very flimsy. So if something's happening up on the second floor, if you can hear playing with the dog, I can't I just I don't I, I know that people have said opposite. I can't believe somebody on the first and second floor couldn't have heard, you no. know, uh, uh, knifing up in the third. I don't I'm sorry. I don't believe it. And I I don't think a juror is going to buy it either. And I don't think a juror is going to take kindly to the fact that, oh, the the crime scene has been uh, destroyed. Right. You know, well, that, if you think that, about it, Dylan heard everything else. She heard Kaylee what sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog. She heard what sounded like Kaylee say there's someone here. She heard Zana crying. She heard a man say, I'm here to help you. So she heard everything else. Right. But she didn't hear the quadruple homicide that was happening right above her head. That makes no sense. No, that makes no sense at, at all. all. You know, I was trying a case one time where uh, it was a it was a property dispute. It was a borderline dispute. And the 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 border between these two properties was mud and rocks and dirt. And you had to climb up a hill. And it was not a jury trial. It was a it was a property dispute. And uh, it was to a judge only. But the judge actually wanted to take a view. So the judge, you know, got in her car. She drove, I'm going to guess it was probably about 20, 25 miles to this property. And she put on her boots. And we, the, the, uh, it was myself and the attorney on the other side, we showed the judge, here's, the, here's where we think it should be. Here's where they think it should be. And she in her boots climbed up through the rocks to see the property line. I like that. I like that. I, I, I like that. I like that a judge was willing to go do that because, you know, that might have saved a lot of time because for her to go see yeah. it with her own eyes might have saved a lot of time. Yeah, because, you know, I can show you drawings and I can show you pictures and I right. can draw a line on a whiteboard, which I have over there. But that does that's abstract. That doesn't right. show you where the rocks are and where the natural property line should be and where the real property line is. And the same thing applies here. It's not that the, these LIDARs and radars and whatever they are with the, the, might be the best technology in the world. It's not going to give the jury the feel of it. And the other right. the other problem now, it seems like the maybe you disagree with me, but it seems like there's a little bit more cooperation between uh, the prosecution and the defense in this case, but you can not in my jurisdictions, and I don't think in any other jurisdiction, present a um, day in the life or a film or a likeness or any kind of a reconstruction without it being authenticated as being, you know, like what it uh, is uh, supposed to be portraying. It has to be a truthful and accurate representation. Now, Anytime anyone ever proposes a film or some kind of a representation like that, the other side either has to agree that it is a fair and true likeness or they have to be able to uh, convince the judge. So what if the prosecution has all these really nice you know, representations of what the uh, property looks like, but the defense doesn't agree and they object to it and it's kept out of trial? I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's a right. risk that's taken by knocking down that property. That's right. just a real risk. Well, so. and 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 like I said in previous videos, there is a chance that Brian Koberger could be found not guilty. Yep. And if that happens, this crime the crime scene's gone. So that's gonna be a real rough investigation two years down the road, because I can imagine that the people of Moscow are gonna want answers. Oh, I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's next on your list? I lost my list here. What's next on your list? I think I well, shoot, let's talk about, uh, we talked about them knocking down the house. Uh, I have one. What you got? I got uh, number three on my list is the, all the things that you have raised are on my list here. But <laughs> the manner of the investigation itself, just the way the investigation has been conducted. Uh, when uh, Brad, uh, w when Mr. Payne got there, uh, the ISP was already there processing the scene. Right. Well, okay, who's in charge here? And why were there people walking around? Why, why, you know, the way these things are done, standard protocol in a crime, especially a crime of this magnitude, is the first law enforcement that gets there, they seal off the scene. 
That's right. it. Everybody's out of there. You're out of here. One person is named in charge. One person is the agent. One person is in charge of the entire crime scene. And uh, if there were EMTs on the scene, you take the pictures and you take the pictures of their boots. So you have uh, all that evidence. Uh, then one person is in charge. Every single person that walks onto that crime scene has to sign in and sign out so that you know who was there. So right. now we fast forward to the, um, so we already have Moscow police and we already have the the ISP processing the scene. Uh, fast forward to December 30th and the probable cause affidavit in Pennsylvania. Now the FBI is in charge. That's right. okay. I want them to collaborate. I want every single possible resource to be allocated to finding who did this horrible crime. Right. But one who's in charge? Who was I, the who was the one agency that was in charge overseeing the was, was it the FBI running around doing this or that? Was it the ISP? I, so the whole, just the whole investigation seems like a botch job to me from my experience. I think it, I think a lot of it, you know, it's, it, Moscow PD has always made it a point to l let everybody know that this is their investigation. You know, this is their investigation. They're just getting help from these other agencies. But I think that this crime scene was a mess from the beginning because who knows what happened during that eight hours. So, you know, when the call came in, it came in for an unresponsive person. So basically, when they got there, that's when they called additional law enforcement. And then that's when they found the rest of the victims and right. then finally shut down the crime scene. But, you know, I, I, I think that this crime scene was a mess from the beginning. This had to be a forensic mess from, from yeah. the beginning, because if there was other people in that house walking around and stuff like that, you know, like I, the footprint, I feel like the footprint might've been somebody just walking around in that house and stepped in some body fluid and left a footprint. And of course, doesn't want to leave their footprint at the scene as well. So they cleaned it up. Is it, is it that, and, and you, you may well be right, but is it that, or is it that, you know, people were walking all over the place and that's the only footprint that they mentioned in the PCA. I mean, I've heard people say that, that there might've been other footprints and that's the only one they had to mention in the, in the probable cause affidavit. I don't want, know right. what to make of it. Right. But if there, well, a lot if of people say, you know, he left without leaving a trail or whoever did this left without leaving a trail, but we really don't know that they didn't leave a trail because we don't, we don't really know any of that information. No, we don't. Know? It, so it's possible that there was a trail. You know, it's very possible, but I, I, I do believe that law enforcement honed in on something right away. There was some sort of indication and, and I, I kind of feel like it, it could definitely possibly be an informant, maybe really? a co-defendant. Really? I You're think so. I mean, how would they, how I don't, I just don't understand how they, this, this is a huge, huge crime. And I yeah. don't understand how they got to the crime scene and then basically kind of just started, you know, clearing people and and stuff like that. To me, it, it almost appears as though they they found something right away. When when Chief Fry came out and said that they didn't believe that the community was in danger, automatically my first thought was they have a suspect or that one so one of the suspects was possibly you know deceased at this crime scene or possibly injured and taken to the hospital so to me i mean you can't really say that nobody's in danger unless you have eyes on a suspect in my in my opinion and so to me as soon as he said that 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 was my first thought was that they have a suspect in custody well, you may well be right, but if they have some informant or something like that, why why wouldn't they put that right at the top of the probable cause affidavit instead of this kind of fishy stuff that hasn't stood up? It hasn't stood up to the test of time right. over these many, many months when people go through that. You know, the, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The first time I read the probable cause affidavit, I said, that's it. They got him. He's 12 times uh, driving around in the months before, and then they have his car going in and out of there, and oh, they have the DNA. Oh, that's it. That's that was my first impression. Right, right. <laughs> the second time I read it, I went, wait a minute. And the third time, I was with a friend, actually, who pointed out, Andy, did you see this? 
No. Yeah. Andy, did you see that? No. <laughs> so I'll admit that it took someone else like really opening my mind. But then when I went back and read it again, it's just none of it made sense. So my question to you is if they have some kind of a great informant and they're so confident, why wouldn't that be right in there? Why wouldn't they put that at the top? That's what I don't understand. I don't I, I don't okay. understand why they would drag this out. You know, to me, I feel like I feel like if they have him, if they have the goods on Brian Koberger, I feel like they would have presented that by now. Yeah. But yeah. they haven't. And I, I don't know if maybe they're they're protecting their informant or I don't know that there is an informant. But I feel like there was something that law enforcement found immediately that led them to Brian Koberger. And yeah. I don't know what that is. You know, who knows? It might have been something at the crime scene. It might have been a witness. It might have been, like I said, you know, it might have been an informant that was giving them information right away. Because it just seemed like as soon as this started, that as soon as the, as soon as law enforcement got to this crime scene, it seems like they started clearing people right away. And it seems like, you know, they started reassuring the public that everything was OK. And to me, that would see I mean, this is a pretty brutal crime. I, of I would, you know, so I would think that that, you know, they they might have somebody in custody. And that's what I thought when I heard Chief Fry say that is I thought they have somebody in custody. Well, I don't know. I, I don't. This is the first point in which we're going to disagree. And that is that I, I I go back to what I said at the very beginning of this uh, episode is that I think the reason they said everything's OK, there's nothing to worry about. is It's just in the government public policy playbook right. you want to assuage the public you know anytime there's that's anything a good like point. this that's a good point just, too you know even even uh during covid they wanted oh just put your mask on and stay six feet away and take right. our uh, take our vaccine and you'll be fine the public is going to be fine you know like i said at three mile island everything's going to be fine right. you know whenever there's a whenever there's any kind of a calamity or a disaster oh we want to assure the public that everything's so fun. so that's that's how i read that's how i read into that yeah i do not know i think we've hit all um five of my issues <clears throat> the one that we really didn't hit is the um Dare I even bring it up? Dare I even bring this one up? This is number six. So we were going All to right. talk about the top drugs, the involvement of drugs. Yeah, there's no proof. Uh, the autopsy found that there were no drugs in the bodies of the four people. So we're not I'm not casting aspersions on anyone, any individual, not saying anyone did anything wrong. But right. come on now. It's a party house. The police had been there three times in the several months before this crime. Party is a synonym for drugs. Look it up in the Urban Dictionary. So I you can't tell me that drugs didn't have some role in this. You know, I, it's the one thing that people don't like to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about it. And but I agree with you. I, I think that, uh, you know, th this looks like a narcotics type of crime. It, it, it just that's what it appears to be. And that's what I've done from the beginning. It very much so. And and, you know, of course, everybody wants to sweep that under the rug. They don't want to talk about that. But that's right. what it looks like. That, it that's sure what does. this looks like. And And, you know, another thing about the narcotics is. A lot of people say, well, why is everybody talking about narcotics? And it's like, because the people that were close to this crime in the very beginning were talking about narcotics. I mean, how many yeah. times <clears throat> do people say that there were narcotics in that house and narcotics were being, you know, were being sold out of that house? That came up a lot in the very beginning of this investigation. There was a lot of talk about that. And again, we're just speculating here, but I mean, of the, amount of the amount of rage that is behind these four um knifings the amount of rage behind that it just it it has the ring of truth when you and i'm not saying that uh demetrius or emma had anything to do with it i mean i'm sure we've all read all that stuff it's in right. uh, it's in those articles by howard blom so i don't know people out there and that want to comment down below you're right i wasn't there and i don't know but just the amount of rage maybe a 54 stabbings to one of the victims and the right. the talk that uh, there, there were drugs in the house and one of them got rid of the drugs and someone was not real happy with that. I mean, there's a motive right there. Every there, crime has right. some kind of motive. And one of the cab drivers early on, I'm sure you read it. One of the cab drivers early on, or not a cab driver, uh, one of the uh, Uber or Lyft drivers said, I used to drive people there all the time. They knew that that's where they went to get drugs. So right. 
I mean, that uh, was stated by a lot. Like, there was a number of students that talked about narcotics involved in this house. Yeah. And, you know, that's why it, it kind of, I, I got confused because the people around the around this crime, you know, the parents and stuff like that, of course, they're going to want to say there was no narcotics involved. I mean, of course, they're going to want to say that. But I feel like it, I, I, I feel like everybody in the beginning of this investigation was talking about narcotics alongside this house. So I feel like there's something there. You know, why, why would they all be saying that if, if, if there was, you know, if, if there was no sign of narcotics around this house. And again, I'm not casting any aspersions on the six people who were in that uh, house, the four right. that lost their lives that night or Bethany or Dylan. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about those right. six people or their they're involvement. Kids. They're, these are college they're kids, kids and they're gonna, you know, they're kids, they're college kids. And, you know, as parents, we all like to think that our kids are at college, you know, studying hard and, and just, you know, going to, you right. know, pray and praying, you know, but, but they're not, <laughs> you know, they're, yeah. they're out, they're out, you know, beginning their lives. And so I've never felt any judgment towards any of any of these students that lived in this house. I mean, they, these were these were young college students that were and, living their lives, you know. Right. And the story, if it's true, it may not be true, it may be true. We're just speculating again. But the story is that they didn't want the drugs in that house anymore. So they got rid of them. And so whoever wanted their money for those drugs was furious. And that's why this happened. I don't know if that's true. I really don't. It looks it, it looks a lot like that, though. It looks a lot like that. And you can't tell me you can't tell me the drugs didn't have something to play in this because they're four college kids. As you just said, they're just living their life. They're doing their thing. They're just being, you know, college kids going right. out to a bar and coming uh, home to the uh, stopping at the food truck. It just it, the, the, the version <clears throat> that we've been given just doesn't to me have the ring of truth. No, no, it seems very it's it, it's very odd like you know I've, I've always said i i keep i keep thinking that you know the prosecution is just going to pull a rabbit out of a hat and and have something because it also seems to me like they're ready to go to trial at any time you read my mind you read my mind that was a question i was going to ask you they they seem to be gung-ho to have this trial they they're wanted ready. it in the yeah they wanted it in the summer uh, of 2024, which is coming pretty quickly. At least I hope I'm sick of this new England weather, but right. um, do you think they're going to pull a rabbit out of their hat? Do you think that there's some evidence that we don't know about? That's just really going to be the smoking gun. I, I mean, I feel like there's a possibility because I feel like they don't even have all of their evidence together, but they're ready to go to trial right now. And so to yeah. me, that leads me to believe that they have the rabbit in the hat. I, 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 I have to believe that because, I mean, why wouldn't they want to wait until they have all of their evidence together also, unless they feel that they have something that, you know, is what they need. You may be right. You may be right. I have a thought in the back of my head that should probably stay there and should stay <laughs> unspoken, but I'll, I will say it. Okay. I will say it. And, I just don't know if the prosecution team is really up to snuff. I mean, I've dealt with a lot. Of, I've been practicing law for 30 years and I've uh, I'm a civil litigation attorney. I've done I've done criminal law. I usually right. associate myself with someone who really is at the top of their game when I do criminal law. Right. Uh, but the prosecutors I have dealt with. They might be nice people that sell Christmas trees in the church parking lot, but uh, on the job, they are sharp. They are single minded. They are professional. They are sharp. They are a little bit mean. I don't see that in the prosecution team in Idaho. I don't know. I just said it. I just I don't. I don't think it's the A team prosecuting this case. I think I it's agree. the B team. I, I, think it's, I agree. And this and, is a big case. It's a huge case, as you pointed out before. This is a huge case, and I don't see it, the type of prosecution I'm used to seeing in in cases. Right. It's just what about the defense? Do you? I mean, what do you think about about that? Do you feel like? Do you feel? I mean, this. Do you feel as though the defense is aggressive enough? 
I'll only say this. I'll say that, um, you know, to, to be certified, again, I'm only a member of the bar in two jurisdictions, but I think the same is true in Idaho or anywhere. To become a court-appointed defense attorney, you have to be certified. You have to go through a certain level of training and then in-court experience, internship, right. whatever they want to call it. And you have to accrue a certain number of hours. And then your mentor has to approve that, yeah, you've got whatever it takes to be a court-appointed defense attorney because this right. rises to constitutional levels. Now, that's that's a court-appointed defense attorney. To be certified to do a capital case, which this is, there's a whole nother level of approvals. Right. Uh, I hate to use the comparison, but it's like the comparison between a normal driver's license and a CDL driver's license. Got gotcha. you. Bad, bad comparison. But you have to go through an awful lot of training and expertise. So I don't know. I like to think that Ann Taylor and the and Jay Logston and uh, the whole team, I'd like to think that they're on the top of their game Um it does get, seem like uh, it does seem like Ann Taylor is frustrated. Yeah. You know, yeah. she seems very frustrated in this last hearing. She she seems frustrated. Yeah, I just I don't think I don't you know, I don't I don't think the prosecution is the A team. Um, having I, said I that, agree. The, the only other issue on my list, the only other and if you have another issue, let me know. The only other issue on my list, and I know you've talked about this, is the IgG, the oh. DNA. And I know you could talk about that for an hour, but yeah. Um I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't know anything about how they come to these conclusions or how they get these results. But I do understand what they do with these results afterward. And this IgG, it, it, it's such a strange, it, that's a really strange aspect of these, of this case. Yeah. I don't know a lot about it either, but I, I, you know, I've read the motions and I think you have too, from having watched you and I watched your really brilliant commentary. Don't put yourself Thank down you. in terms of your level of knowledge. Neither one of us is a scientist, <laughs> but you can reason and read and think and react. And sure. I've read, I've read the 38 and 40 page uh, memoranda that are of record. And I did a previous episode uh, two episodes, one in which I uh, I cited a uh, a journal uh, that was written about IgG, and it said it's a, it's an evolving science. It's not a settled science. Right. And then I cited two court cases in Connecticut uh, in which the judge just had a real dim view of uh, IgG, and one conviction was actually overturned on several grounds, but one of the grounds was the IgG and that Connecticut court case that I cited, you know, right. really lambasted the technology. So I don't think you even need to get to the point where you, you know, have a thorough knowledge of every single thing in the IgG. Here's how I feel about it. And I just really briefly, if as the prosecution says, it's irrelevant and it's not going to be used to trial, if it's, if it's, if it's a nothing burger, just give it all to the defense. Why right. are they fighting over it? And oh, sure, tell the defense, fine. Here, give it to them and say, okay, you can't disseminate any of this information. Just keep it to yourselves. If right. you want to disseminate it now, sure, go back to court. But I don't, I don't see why they are wasting so much time and effort and brain power and court resources arguing over it if it's a nothing burger. Right. Well, I, I think Ann Taylor is trying to establish how her client was arrested. And I think the IgG has a lot to do with that. But I feel like the prosecution is saying, well, don't worry about the IgG anymore. We're not worried about that anymore. We have a we have a cheek swab now. So I feel <laughs> like it just to me. What I don't understand. It, well, and, and, and you would probably know more about this. But so now the judge, you know, judge judge now has seen all of this IgG information. Right. And so now he's kind of picked through it and decided what the defense can take a look at. So what I wonder is, does that create a conflict of interest with the judge at this point? Because now the judge and the prosecution, now they have the, all of this information, but the defense does not. I heard you say that in your uh, episode on the uh, DNA. And I, all my listeners uh, and viewers, please go listen to his. <laughs> I got it back. Go listen <laughs> to his episode on that because it was really thoughtful. When I heard you say that, I said, that's a really good point. That is a really good point that now the judge has all of the information, but right. the defense can only have a portion of it. And I think I think that's a really good point. I, think I mean, I feel really like it would point. create a problem if the if the judge and the prosecution share are sharing knowledge and the defense has no idea about that. Yeah, I think that's so I don't really know. I don't point. know how that all works, but it just seemed kind of odd to me. 
I don't know how that would work either. The cases I've been involved in disclose, uh, disclosure, 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 and then later we'll determine at trial what's relevant, what the jury sees, you know, what, right. we, what we disclose. So it's a it's an issue I frankly haven't seen. And I think you raise a good uh, point. I mean, if I was Mr. Koberger's attorneys, I'd be scratching my heads right. over that one. OK, so I asked you what your top five were. I guess we got that out of you. Uh, yeah. Do you have any other uh, closing thoughts before? I can't believe we've been uh, yammering here for almost an hour. <laughs> yeah. You know, we could probably talk about this all day. Yeah. You know, Easily. there's there's Easily. a lot to talk about. So um, I would like, again, to encourage my viewers to go over to uh, Lucky's channel. Uh, Unfiltered Lucky is the name of it. And uh, check his channel out because he, you know, we we do these kind of um, one, two, three, top 10, top five red flags. Right. But he goes into a lot of detail. And uh, do you have any closing thoughts for us, Lucky? Not at all. I appreciate you having me on here today. It was a lot of fun. Can I just ask you one question? How did you get into podcasting? What What is it about podcasting that drove you to get into it? You know, it's funny because uh, I, I, I've only been on, on YouTube for just over five months. Mm -hmm. So, and I had been, a lot of, a lot of people around me had always said, you know, you need to start a podcast. You need to do this. Cause I, true crime is something that I've been into for a long time. Um, my background, my experiences, stuff like that have kind of lended to, to true crime. So uh, the Idaho four case, it was actually what kind of drove me to start a channel because there was just so much involved in that case. And, and I was watching information about it and I had information about it and I, I wanted to talk about it. And, you know, honestly, when I started my channel, I thought it was going to be like 20 of us sitting around talking about true crime. You know, I, I, I never yeah. really, I never expected my channel to grow the way that it has. And, and so it's just a, you know, it's a surprise to me. And I think that, you know, like I said, I thought I was going to start this channel and we'd have just some people sitting around talking about true crime. So uh, yeah. so it's been a pleasant surprise. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I've been following true crime for years. I'm a, it's, it's kind of ironic. And my friends ask me about it. Why are you a civil litigation attorney? I mean, I do personal injury. I do bankruptcy and other civil matters. Right. Uh, but you've been reading true crime your whole life. I remember reading, uh, you know, in cold blood. I remember reading Helter Skelter. And then I just, then in the eighties, I discovered Ann Rule, and her writing just really blew me away. I, 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 I've said it before. One of one of the things on my bucket list is to read all of her books. But so that, yeah. you know, I've always read true crime. I've always, um, you know, when I was a reporter, I covered mm -hmm. crime. But somehow I got into the litigation thing, and I've done the civil thing. So, right, when podcasts came along. I mean. Yeah, it's a it's an amazing thing to cover, and there's just so much interest. And I, I'm sure, as you know, you've done the research. Oh, yeah. One of the things that makes a good um, episode is curiosity. People have sure. this innate curiosity that they need to find answers to questions that just naturally come up. And this case, the Idaho Four case, has generated many, many, many more questions than right. answers. Right. And that's and that's that's something about my channel too is that I like to share my ideas and my my views and and my thoughts, but I also like to hear other people's thoughts and I like to hear their views, you know. And so that's that's one thing that's really cool is I like to I like all the information sharing and you know everybody talking about you know this case because there's been some thoughts that I've had that I was dead set on and I've had people in the comments change my mind and make me feel differently about it. So you know, I approach everything with an open mind and, mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I know everything, you know, I, 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 I love to hear everybody's information and, and that's kind of how I form my thoughts. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. We, uh, we do read our comments and at the end of the show, we often will read some of our comments. I just say one thing as we're about ready to close, I ask people sure. to please be kind, be respectful. Let's be professional because kind of as uh, Lucky just said, if you keep your ears and your eyes and your mind open, you might learn something. I mean, I, I initially had totally different thoughts than I have now. The more I read, the further away I get from my initial impressions about this case. Right, so right. I'm the same as you. I've learned a lot and I know that I'll... I'll learn more. So, okay. So with those closing thoughts, Lucky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time. I feel honored that you uh, were willing to come onto our podcast and share your uh, view of things. No, oh, thanks for having me, man. I feel honored to be here. Okay. Have a good one. You have been watching About the Law. 
a production of the law offices of Andrew D. Myers in Methuen in the Merrimack Valley of Massachusetts and in Derry, just outside of Manchester, New Hampshire. Remember to click the like and subscribe buttons down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to share it with your friends and others. If you'd like to talk to me about an injury case, a car accident, a slip and fall, a serious bodily injury case, or some other case, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk to you. You can contact us through my website at attorney-myers.com. We have a contact us block, or you can call on one of the telephone numbers we've given there, or you can email me at andrew at attorney Myers. Com. The foregoing is offered for informational purposes only. It is not intended as and does not constitute legal advice. Laws vary widely from state to state. You should rely only on the advice given to you during a personal consultation by a local attorney thoroughly familiar with state laws and the area of practice in which your concern lies. This podcast must be and hereby is labeled advertisement in some jurisdictions. And that's that. All right, man.